Well, we are returning to our study of the book of Mark this morning. We are ready for chapter 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We're making some progress through the book of Mark. Uh, as we're examining Mark chapter 12, verses 1 to 12 this morning, uh, I've titled the message, Don't Reject the Glue. You'll understand it as we go throughout the morning. Don't reject the glue. We've got to recall what happened in chapter 11 if we want to fully understand chapter 12. And we've had a couple of weeks where we've had Thanksgiving sermons. So I wanted to take us back and kind of remind us a little bit of what happened in chapter 11 as we get started here in chapter 12 this morning. In chapter 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem with the people shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Literally giving him that authority of the Messiah and King. They placed palm branches on the ground in front of him, showing their respect. Then Jesus visited the temple, took a look around, went over to stay with Mary and Martha and Lazarus for the night. As he was heading back into Jerusalem, he stopped along the roadside to curse a fig tree. Remember that? He's going to use that as an example later on. Then when he got to the temple, when he got into Jerusalem, he did some temple cleansing. He went in and he chased out the money changers and he chased out the people selling animals. And he told them that his father's house was to be a house of prayer. And he let them know that he was very well aware of the fact that they had turned his father's house into a den of thieves and robbers. Now you can imagine how the religious elite must have felt as they watched Jesus turning over those tables and chasing out those money changers and those sellers of animals. Jesus was messing with their golden goose. Jesus was messing with their cash cow. And they are really, really ticked at Jesus for what he's done. The religious elite asked Jesus the logical question. By what authority are you doing these things? Or Snowden paraphrase for emphasis. Jesus, what in the world do you think you're doing? Or maybe like this. Jesus, who in the world do you think you are coming in here doing stuff like this? What gives you the right to barge in here and mess things up? Our text today tells us how Jesus responded to these religious elite. And he does so with the story that's going to prick them where it hurts. Let's get started this morning by reading Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse number 1. It says there, He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. And he sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying... They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. You know, before we go any further in our study of Mark chapter 12 this morning, we need to gain a, a bit of a historical footing so that we know that this was pretty much commonplace during this time and during this era. This kind of a setup, it was just done naturally in many places around the area of Judea and Jerusalem and Samaria. It, it was normal. A landowner would lease out a farm to tenants. The agreement would go something like this. I'm going to get everything ready for you guys. I'm going to plant the vines. I'm going to build a fence around it. I'm going to build a pit so that you can squish out the wine from the grapes. I'm going to build a tower so you can see the whole place and watch over it and keep the harvest safe. And then once you've protected it and once you've watched over it, and once you've taken care of the grapes and you've turned them into wine, I'm going to come and receive a portion of what you have produced as payment for me allowing you to use my vineyard. 
Once the harvest was in and the wine was prepared, the tenants would normally hand over a portion of what they had been able to harvest from the grapes. In this case, however, the owner had given the tenants a great deal of latitude. He'd waited a good while. He had waited over and over again for them to do what was right. They've been running the place for a good while. It's time for them to pay up. We find in verse number two, the owner sends a servant to collect what's due. We're told that they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. They gave him nothing, not a, not a single bit of grape juice, wine. In my case, I'd want grape jelly, but did, didn't give him anything. In verse four, we find he sends another servant. They struck him on the head and they treated him shamefully. In verse five, we're told that he sent another servant and this time they killed him. They killed him. They made him P-E-A-D dead. Jesus is making it extremely clear that there's more than enough evidence to convict these tenants. But he's not done yet. The owner sent more servants. More and more and more servants. They beat some, they killed others. Not a single one of them had been able to collect a, a single cent, a single bit of wine from these caregivers of the vineyard. Finally, the owner sent his son to them. This was going to be the last chance he was going to give this bunch of wicked tenants. While this seems very strange to us, we're told that he thought that might, they might. He gave them another chance. Just maybe, just maybe they would respect his son enough to, to do what was right. Possibly. Maybe they would repent. Maybe they would do what was right. But the tenants thought much differently than the owner thought. I'm guessing that the tenants thought, now if the son is coming, then the owner must be dead. Maybe that's why he's sending his son. Or, or maybe they thought, if the owner's sending his son, he must be getting too old and too feeble to take care of business himself. I, we're not told, but either one would pretty much fill the bill and make sense in the context of what we're reading. What we are told is that they thought if they knocked off the air, then the property would be up for grabs and they could claim it for their own. Now, that's not a real hard conclusion to reach in the culture they were living in. Today, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to us, but back then it made pretty good sense. Tenants, you see, could inherit the land they worked if for some reason the owner and his heirs died. If there was no one there to inherit the property, they had been working it, they could keep it for themselves. If there was no one there to protect the property and to say, that is mine, then they could claim it as their own. They thought they had hit the jackpot. I mean, the owner's not coming himself. He sent a whole bunch of people. He didn't really respond to any of this stuff that we've done. He sent his son. We've knocked off the air. We are going to be in control of this vineyard. That's what they thought. But Jesus makes it clear that these tenants have misjudged the owner. The owner is alive and he is well. And they've just plotted. In fact, they are in the process of plotting the death of the owner's son. It's pretty obvious that the owners are not going to be happy campers. Jesus, his father, they're not happy about what these religious elite are doing. At this point, down in verse 9, Jesus throws out a question to the religious elite who are represented by the wicked tenants in this story. What do you guys think the owner of the vineyard is going to do? How do you think he's going to handle this? Oh, they're not stupid. The answer is obvious. He's going to come. He's going to destroy these wicked tenants and he's going to get new ones. Friends, the owner, the owner is not dead. The owner is not weak. In the case of this parable, the owner is God. He has the power. He has the ability to take these tenants out. In the case of this story, God's the vineyard owner. The prophets are the servants who were mistreated and some of them even killed. Jesus himself was the son that they plotted against and murdered. 
The vineyard represents the people of God. He's left the people of God in the hands of the religious elite. They're supposed to be guiding them. They're supposed to be protecting them. They're supposed to be teaching them and helping them to grow and mature into the kingdom that they should be. But instead, the religious elite have been fleecing God's people for years. In the process, they've been stealing from God himself. Jesus is making it clear that his father has been sending servants to these religious elite for years. And over and over again, they have stiffened their necks. They have rejected the prophets. They have rejected the messengers that God's been sending. This parable that Jesus is about to tell or is in the process of telling is covertly answering their question, who gives you the authority to take away our cash cow? Who gives you the authority to take away our golden goose? What do you think you're doing coming here and making demands on us? This parable is making it clear exactly what authority Jesus is working under. The authority of his father. The authority of God himself. In verse 12, we're told that the religious elite, they get it. They're not oblivious to what's going on. This isn't just some storybook that Jesus is reading to them. This is their story. And they know it. Jesus is calling them evil tenants. And they understand exactly what he's doing. Like the tenants in the parable, the leaders have no regard for Jesus, even though he's God's son. In fact, even now, this group of religious elite are in the process of plotting, planning, and trying to carry out the death of Jesus. Very soon, they're going to get her done. Very soon, they're going to get her done. They're going to put him on a cross with the help of Rome. Jesus will soon tell them in Mark 13 that not one stone of this temple that you're so proud of is going to be left on another. He's telling these religious elite that they're right. God's going to take them out for mistreating and killing his servants and for planning, plotting, and carrying out the death of his son, Jesus Christ. That's exactly what will happen in AD 70. They may not believe it now, but there's going to be dire consequences for the actions that they're plotting against the Son of God. It's coming. And that brings us to Mark chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Put a little piece of paper in here so I can find it easier. Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse number 10. Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Guys, I don't do this a lot, but sometimes the words are important. The word used here can refer either to a capstone or to a cornerstone. And it's translated in both ways in different passages. Both were extremely important parts of a structure, of a building. The cornerstone was a large rock cut to perfect proportions. It was then carefully placed in the corner of the building as part of the foundation. And then they would use that stone to make measurements so that the whole building would come out square. Somebody forgot that stone in the house I'm working on right now. There's nothing square in that place. The capstone was the stone placed in the middle of an arch. Kind of a V-shaped stone placed in the middle of an arch. Both sides of the arch leaned on it. And it, that capstone made it all stay together as they rested on the capstone. It was the stone that held the arch together. Paul wanted us to understand the underlying implications of this whole idea of this word and how it fits together in the kingdom of God. So he tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Ephesians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, thank goodness for it. He says here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, I think I'll just summarize it because we're, we're running out of time here. It says, Jesus is the capstone, but goes on in verse 21 to explain what he means. He says that in Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Do you know how... God describes his church. It's a building made up of living stones. Living stones. All built into a 
a temple of God. In essence, what he says when he says, I'm the capstone, I'm the cornerstone, Snowden paraphrase, Jesus is saying, I'm the glue that holds this kingdom together. In terms that we can understand. I am the glue that holds this building together. Jesus, God, is the glue that bonds living stones together into an organism that we call the church of Jesus Christ. Now, if we don't get this, if we reject the cornerstone, if we reject the capstone, if we reject the glue that holds the kingdom together, then we'll be broken by the very thing that should have fastened us together in Christ. In the end, we'll be broken, now get this, for all eternity. For without the capstone, without the cornerstone, without the glue that holds it all together, we are nothing more than a pile of rocks, a pile of rubble. Because Jesus is the pattern, you see, that we build by. Jesus is the jig that guides us. Jesus shows us how to live as members of his kingdom. And then he bonds us together, like the old song says, with cords of love that cannot be broken. The message is clear. Jesus is the stone that was rejected cast aside by the would-be builders, the religious elite of his day. But God will vindicate Jesus by raising him from the dead to serve as the stone the church is built around. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. God will vindicate Jesus by raising him from the dead and helping him to build the church that we're a part of today. He's the glue that holds us together. He'll provide the grace that covers us and makes us a part of his eternal kingdom. The religious elite who will soon be nothing more than rubble on the pages of history. The vineyard will be given to others. The church, the kingdom will be given to others who will serve as God's tenants giving him his due. And that brings us to Mark chapter 12, verse 12. Then they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowds. So they left him and went away. They were waiting to a safer time to take Jesus down. The religious elite knew exactly what Jesus was telling him. He was telling them that they were the ones who were refusing to give God his due. They were the ones who were beating and mistreating and killing the prophets. They were the ones plotting the death of Jesus. Jesus laid it all out for them. He knew what they were doing and it ticked them off that he knew what was going on. So what they did is they tried to get rid of him. Man, that happens even in America today. Somebody's revealing what's going on and they try to get rid of him. They're 100% sure that this whole story was calling them out. And I've got news for you. It was calling them out. But rather than clean up their act, they decided to get rid of the one who was revealing their evil ways. Does that not sound familiar? God's patient and God's loving and God's kind. But God won't tolerate sin forever. There's a limit, and these guys had reached it. I wonder if we're not reaching that limit in America today. Think about what's going on in this country. You flip on the TV, and girls with girls, guys with guys, shoot them up, bang them up, kill them all. You can't even trust the news anymore. It doesn't deliver facts, it delivers ideologies. They're doing away with the Ten Commandments. They're doing away with the nativity scene, closing down churches. You have to wonder if we're not about to reach God's limits as well. Like the cursed fig tree, these guys are on their way to the fire. And if we don't change our ways in America, I'm afraid we may be on the way to the fire too. 
They had access to God's amazing grace, as do we. But instead of reaching out and accepting his gift of love, his gift of grace, they rejected Jesus. They rejected the cornerstone. They rejected the capstone. They rejected the glue of the kingdom. And as a result, all of their fake religiosity will soon be nothing more than rubble on the ground. The temple they prize will be burned. The gold in the temple, the silver on the walls is going to melt and run into the cracks between those huge stones. In order to strip it of its riches, they will tear those stones apart one by one so that the gold and silver can be removed. Jesus' prediction will become their reality. The question we need to ask today as we close this study here in this chapter, first part of, of chapter 12 of Mark is this. Are we accepting Jesus' gift of grace paid for with his blood? Or are we following the path of the religious elite who were simply there to rake in the rewards of their religiosity? Are we viewing Jesus as our cornerstone, as our capstone, as our glue? Or do we view him as our cash cow, our golden goose, our magic genie, if you will? If you're ready to say, Jesus, here I am, a living stone? Place me where you want me to be in your church? Then now's the time to chime in as we sing together. Ring the bells.